all physical systems will interact with real signals and we can represent a real signal in terms of complex quantities like you know that a phasor is represented as a e power j theta a is the amplitude theta is the angle and using Euler's theorem you can write e power j theta as cos theta plus j sin theta similarly a sinusoidal signal a sinusoidal signal which is a cos omega naught t plus theta a is the magnitude or the amplitude of the signal omega naught is angular frequency theta is the angle can be represented as mathematically it can be represented as a by 2 into e power j omega naught t plus theta plus a by 2 into e power minus j omega naught t minus theta where t can lie in the interval minus infinity to plus infinity so if we represent this signal using complex exponentials like e power j x plus e power minus j x then we get a double sided amplitude and phase spectra double sided amplitude and phase r spectra because you see that you know, there are two vectors one vector rotating in anti-clockwise direction the other vector rotating in clockwise direction so the resultant of these two vectors will uh, will give you the sinusoidal signal a cos omega naught t plus theta which which also means that so each real signal I mean this is the signal that is going to interact with the physical system right so each real signal can have a representation which which has two terms both the positive positive and negative terms so this from this it is clear that this will result in double sided spectra double sided spectra so result in double sided spectra there are two important points that you need to know about the double sided spectra because when I say double sided spectra so you will have you know the discrete lines at both positive side and negative side right say f naught and minus f naught so what does this indicate the negative frequencies there is actually no concept of negative frequencies. physically they don't exist but they come into picture because of the real si signals that are represented in its in their exponential form so the lines of the negative frequencies they are present only because it is necessary to add this complex conjugate phasors so you say that e power jx is a complex conjugate of e power minus jx right so it is necessary to add this complex conjugate phasors to obtain the real sinusoidal signal a real sinusoidal signal that is a cos omega naught t plus theta so that is the reason why you have this negative frequency if there are no negative frequencies then you there is no possibility for these two phasors to get combined to form a real signal so do understand that this this physically doesn't exist it is only the mathematical phenomenon which has resulted in the negative frequencies that is the first point you need to know about the lines at the negative frequencies the second one is the amplitude spectrum this is the phase spectrum right e power jx and e power minus jx are related to the phase spectrum so the amplitude spectrum very important one mark question for any real signal the amplitude spectrum has even symmetry has even symmetry that means they if you look at if you plot the amplitude spectrum so you will have the same figure in both left axis right ha right ha right hand or the right part of the figure and and also the left left part of the figure 
it's called even symmetry while the phase spectrum the phase spectrum will have odd symmetry will have odd symmetry this is the important point to be noted for real signals frequently asked one mark question in gate IES and other PSU exams the real signal amplitude spectrum always has even symmetry and the phase spectrum always has odd symmetry we will look at uh, these signals a bit more when we get into this uh, this course and also in in communication theory however do understand the concept of the phasor signals and the representation of of these real signals in terms of the com the, uh, the complex quantities let us look at one more mathematical technique that is frequently used in communication theory that is convolution very important least one question you can expect on convolution in gate or IES so if there are two time domain signals x1 of t and x2 of t so the convolution of these two signals can be represented as say y of t which is equal to x1 of t convolved with x2 of t and this will be equal to integral minus infinity to infinity x1 of tau to x2 of t minus tau is it d t or d tau it should be d tau because the resultant is a function of time and if you integrate it with respect to tau then only you will get a function which depends on time otherwise if you write it as d t here then the resultant function should be y of tau which is not correct I am not going to prove this as this proof is available in all the standard textbooks but I want you to know how to how to find out the convolution of these two signals well we will solve some examples in the later parts of this course this is how you can find out the convolution of two signals in time domain however convolution satisfies certain properties like commutative property which says that the convolution of these two signals x1 of t convolved with x2 of t should be equal to x2 of t convolved with x1 of t this is called commutative property second associative property what is associative property x1 of t convolved with x2 of t and the resultant if it is convolved with x3 of t so this should be equal to x1 of t convolved with x2 of t convolved with x3 of t if this condition is satisfied then we say it is it has got associative nature and convolution satisfies the associative property the third one is a distributive property distributive property which is x1 of t convolved with x2 of t plus x3 of t what should be the resultant now the resultant should be x1 of t convolved with x2 of t plus x1 of t convolved with x3 of t so convolution satisfies these three properties commutative property associative property and distributive property so the convolution in discrete domain also satisfies these properties so if you take the convolution with unit impulse you know the unit impulse function or that is delta of t or you also represent call it as Dirac delta function we say it as unit impulse or sometimes referred to as Dirac delta function 
So what happens if you take the convolution of a signal with these uh, Dirac delta functions? It's very important. You you will you will get at least one question on this convolution in in your exam. So if a signal x of t is convolved with the delta of t, what what will be the result? So convolution of a signal with the impulse function will result in the same signal. X of t convolved with delta of t will be x of t. Number two, if x of t, what happens if f of x of t is convolved with a delayed impulse function, convolved with delta of t minus t naught? This will be the delayed input signal, that is x of t minus t naught. Very important. Number three, if the delayed signal x of t minus t1, if it is convolved with delayed impulse function delta of t minus t2, this will result in the delayed input signal by t1 plus t2 units. So this will be x of t minus t1 minus t2. Number four, delta of t minus t1. If you take the convolution of two delta functions, delayed delta functions, delta of t minus t1 convolved with delta of t minus t2, that will result in delta of t minus t1 minus t2. That is, in the convolution of delayed impulse functions will result in a delayed impulse function of both these units. That is, t1 plus t2. So this set is very important.